Let me start by uh, congratulating the organisers of the conference on behalf of the editors of International Socialism for organising such a wonderful event. We held in London a few months ago a very similar conference on the themes of class uh, at work in the contemporary world. And I see the debate that we're engaged in today as part of a collaborative international effort to theorise where we are and the theory of the theory of class. And I hope my um, remarks, which will be quite polemical, will be uh, interpreted in that light in an attempt to push forward a discussion that's happening in many uh, countries at the moment. Let me start by saying that the uh, rumours of the demise of the working class have been much exaggerated. I was reminded very starkly of this two days ago, or, uh, actually yesterday morning, as I flew out of London and witnessed the paralysis or near paralysis of a city of 8 million people by a few hundred, a few thousand people, uh, workers on the London Underground who are engaging in a 48-hour strike. There'll be another 72-hour uh, strike uh, next week. A small reminder of the potential power that uh, small groups of workers still wield in the contemporary, in the contemporary world. Those kind of struggles uh, are simply ignored in the vast bulk of the academic discourse on, on class. I think it might be useful to start by putting in some kind of historical perspective the notion that class has disappeared, vanished, uh, and no longer was a basis for social transformation. Because these arguments are not new arguments, uh, although I think the extent to which they've been com become common sense arguments is far greater than in previous epochs. But the arguments themselves are very old ones. Let me begin by quoting uh, Thomas Cooper. It's a quite well-known quote. Thomas Cooper was a leader of the Chartist movement in the 1840s, centred on the uh, large number textile areas of Lancashire in northern, uh, in northern England. Uh, he went from being a Chartist leader to, in later life, being a liberal, uh, uh, a Gladstonian liberal, a lecturer, itinerant preacher, and so on. This is Thomas Cooper in his autobiography some 30 years later, reflecting on the change that had come over the British working class since the days of Chartism. In our old Chartist time, he writes, Lancashire working men were in rags by thousands, and many of them often lacked food. But their intelligence was demonstrated wherever you went. You would see them in groups discussing the great doctrines of political justice, or they were in earnest uh, dispute respecting the teachings of socialism. Now you will see no such groups in Lancashire, but you will hear well-dressed working men talking as they walk with their hands in their pockets of cooperatives and their shares in them, or building societies. As for betting on horses like their masters, it is perfect madness. And then there's a bit about them walking around with dogs on strings and going to the greyhound races and so on, but you, you get the picture. What you have here in 1870 is a very, very early version of what I would call the bourgeoisification thesis. The notion that the working class movement and the, work, the working class people have been corrupted by being enriched or privileged to such an extent uh, that it's blunted the antagonisms between capital and labour and removed the basis for the kind of movements uh, that were expressed in charters in the great working class movement in the, 18, the 1840s. The most modern version of this, this thesis is the thesis of the salaried bourgeoisie, which I'll come back to. Uh, but it's not just this form of moral corruption that the working class historically succumbs to from time to time. There's a second uh, strand of thought which again runs right back to the origins of the working class itself, which we can call the degradation thesis. Not that workers are so enriched that antagonisms are blunted, but they're so downtrodden, fragmented, atomised, beaten down that they can't resist. Again, there are countless examples you could look at. Let me give one from uh, one of my least favourite uh, people, Beatrice Webb. Uh, Beatrice Webb was one of the founders of, of a movement called Fabianism in, the, in Britain, which looked to the gradual reform and reform of the system and was one of the key ideological components of the, what became the Labour Party, uh, the social democratic tradition in Britain. This is Beatrice Webb's diary entry from July 1894. What can we hope from these myriads of deficient minds and deformed bodies that swarm in our great cities? 
What can we hope from them but brutality, meanness and crime? Whether they are struggling for subsistence at the dock gates or eking out their days in the poor law or penal colony. And so on and so on and so on, a great length about how these downtrodden masses could not be the agents of world transformation and therefore the Fabians and the Labour Party had to do it uh, on their behalf. What's obviously true from the history is that both groups, the Lancastrian workers of the 1870s were so corrupted by their enrichment and uh, equally the downtrodden workers in London that Beatrice Webb is talk uh, that was talking about both these groups were able to historically shrug, shrug off their corruption and engage in extremely militant forms uh, of class struggle in later, in later periods. Nonetheless, the myths about the working class and these arguments persist and recur again and again through the 20th century. The latest version, which uh, Tibor mentioned, uh, is the version of Slavoj Žižek, which uh, he wrote up in the London Review of Books in 2011. Uh, let me quote from Zizek. Zizek is interesting because you get both uh, versions at once in Zizek, two for the price, of, uh, the price of one. This is Zizek. The chance to be exploited in a long-term job is now a privilege. The category of unemployment has expanded to encompass vast ranges of people, from the temporary unemployed, the no longer employable, and the permanently unemployed, to the inhabitants of ghettos and slums, and finally to whole populations and states excluded from the global uh, capitalist process. And then he adds that the 2.5 million public sector workers who went on strike in November 2011 uh, were an example of the salaried bourgeoisie striking uh, to defend the privilege of their surplus, surplus wage. So both elements of the, uh, of the story are here and present in Zizek. As I said before, while such views have been commonplace through the 20th century, I think we're now in the first period in which such views, really since the 1830s and 1840s, such views have become not just commonplace, but really the common sense uh, on the left. Certainly in radical intelligentsia and in the academy and so on, these are absolutely common uh, positions. One other example, uh, Goran Furborn in the uh, issue before last of, London, uh, of New, uh, New Left Review, a little quote. Over the past 30 years, deindustrialization of the North has halted or reversed the forward march of labor. The residual industrial working class of the North remains too weak to pose any anti capitalist challenge. Again and again, you have these arguments, uh, echoing arguments uh, from the past, but very, very common sense arguments now in the movement. What all these arguments have in common, I think, is a misconception of class. And what I think we have to do, I'm, I'm sorry I missed the previous talk, but I think it was a theme in the, in the previous panel, is we have to restate uh, class as above all else a social relationship. Uh, that we cannot associate class with a particular historic arrangement of the forces of production, which are of course historically variable, fluid and change uh, through different periods of history. Nor can we simply associate it with a, with a particular concrete expression of labour. There are common themes in the labour labor process and the capitalism, but they're also quite fluid and, and, and changing and variable. Nor can we uh, associate it with a particular uh, arrangement of uh, relationships on the, on the, on the labour market. Again, there are commonalities through capitalism, but there's huge variation as well. We have to start from class as a social relationship if we want to understand the key fault lines in society and the basis on which the working class can be seen as an agent for its own uh, transformation. Before I come on to what the implications of that view are, I want to briefly consider two uh, influential uh, versions of the argument which have tried to articulate in a more theoretical way these common sense notions of class that are very, very uh, commonplace. Uh, the first one is the very well-known work by Hart and Negri, uh, extremely influential around 2000 when Empire was, was published and it seemed that everyone was buying Empire. I'm not sure how many people read Empire or at least got to the end of it, but certainly huge numbers of people bought this book, uh, later on Multitude, uh, much less interest in Commonwealth and their subsequent writing. But around 2000-2001 it was incredibly 
uh, influential. And I think although there's less direct engagement with Hart and Negri, the kind of ideas that they expressed have permeated through radical thought in a much wider, uh, in a much wider way. What um, Hart and Negri do in a multitude, uh, I think there are two uh, issues I want to draw out about how they approach class. The first issue is that it's grounded in something I'm not really going to talk about, which is a much more far-reaching uh, conception of how society at large has, has, has changed, the transformation uh, of, of the forces of production, the end of the nation-state, uh, and so on and so forth. There's a much broader agenda in Hart and Negri. But the way that I would sum this up is that what they are doing is they're applying to the quite limited transformation of capitalism that's taken place in the last 30 years, the kind of conceptual tools with which Marxism has traditionally approached questions like the transition from feudalism to capitalism. Whereas I, I would see transformation of the forces of relations of production on the basis of capitalism, they're applying a set of tools designed to look at a, a, a far-reaching transformation, a fundamental transformation of social relations of capital. Uh, the second thing is that they tend to associate class um, with a, a quite narrow conception of the working class founded on their experience of workers in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, particularly the mass, so-called mass workers in the, Italian, uh, in the Italian factories. That's really their conception of class. And once that conception of class no longer fits in the modern world, uh, they're forced to reconceptualize the whole, uh, the, the, the whole, the whole situation. Uh, they make two central claims, I think, about labour uh, today in the period of empire um, in what they call post-industrial, uh, post-modernist production. The first claim is that production is no longer centred on the traditional workplace. Instead, the value relationship in which value, surplus value is captured by capital uh, within the workplace has broken down, become smeared across the whole social terrain. At one point in... Uh, I think it's a multitude, they say, if you can come up with some mental innovation in the shower or whilst you're dreaming, there's no way you can capture this stuff. So it, it's simply smeared over the whole social terrain. It's slightly odd, incidentally, that Hart and Negri believe that no worker in the 1960s ever came up with an innovatory idea in the shower. I mean, if you read Braverman's or Burroway's uh, discussions of machine tool lists, there's all kinds of crazy shortcuts and innovations they come up with. But I'm not... Anyway... I think it's a very problematic notion, but this is the first element uh, in, the, in, the, in the conception of the transformation of labour, that it's smeared across the whole social terrain, and that the centrality of the workplace is broken down. Uh, the second claim they make is that the hegemonic form of labour is now immaterial labour. That uh, it's labour, to quote them, which creates immaterial products, such as knowledge, information, communication, a relationship, or an emotional response. They're not claiming that all forms of labour take this form, but they're saying this is a hegemonic form that all forms of labour tend towards in the, contemporary, in the contemporary period. Now, first of all, I think we should be very uh, sceptical, we should, we should have a healthy scepticism as an empirical claim about how capitalism has changed about the rise of material labour. One of the interesting things about empire and, and, and multitude is that, like a lot of this literature, it's based far more on assertion than it is on a serious empirical investigation of late, late for labour force, occupational statistics, and so on and so forth. Uh, some of these sweeping claims are simply not grounded in empirical evidence at all. If, if you simply Google fastest growing occupations in America, for example, you'll very quickly discover that the fastest growing occupations in America uh, are jobs like home helps, personal care aides, uh, food preparation and service workers, tractor and truck drivers. All of these are extremely menial, manual forms uh, of labour. If you know anyone who's been a home help, it involves carrying old people out of their beds and getting around that. And this, this is incredibly manual work. I'm not saying there's no intellectual, mental component to it, but it has a help, uh, healthy degree of, uh, sometimes unhealthy degree of manual uh, manual element to it. Uh, secondly, even if you look at the most mental, uh, intellectual forms of work, they often contain quite a, 
a large material component. I think Arcady will speak about this tomorrow morning in his lecture. He's written some fantastic stuff on mental and material uh, labour processes. But this is an old argument. If you go back to Brandon's Labour and Monopoly Capitalism, there's a wonderful bit where he talks about clerical work and he quotes this um, attempt to impose a tailorist model on the office. And it gives, how long does it take you to swivel in your office chair? How long does it take to open your desk? How long does it take you to pull out a folder? Uh, that there is a material element, not only is there a material element, but it can be quantified, measured, and so on and so forth. The, not only that, but these apparently immaterial mental forms of labour are uh, bound up in material forms of production. Think about all the hype about the dot-com bubble in the 1990s. One of the biggest beneficiaries of this was, of course, Amazon. What was the, the, the first impact of Amazon on the wider labour force? Massively to, to uh, increase the, the amount of traffic in goods, uh, in parcels being delivered, in books being delivered, and to put more and more burden on postal workers, in fact, in Britain, who would actually deliver these packages which are purchased online. You can't separate out the material and material aspects of the labour the, the, the labor process. Finally, at much more, a much more theoretical level, um, is it true that Marx's categories can't uh, encompass the notion of immaterial labour? Absolutely not. Certainly Marx didn't believe that his categories couldn't encompass immaterial labour. Let me give a, a, a short quote from Capital. Uh, it's, it's a discussion in the context of discussing pr productive and unproductive uh, labour processes. Uh, this is what Marx says. If we may take an example from outside the sphere of material production, a schoolmaster is a productive worker when, in addition, in, in, in addition to belabouring the heads of his pupils, uh, he works himself into the ground to enrich the owner of the school. Um, that the latter, the owner of the school, uh, laid out his capital in a teaching factory instead of a sausage factory makes no difference to the relationship. Anyone who works in academia will be familiar with the notion of the teaching factory being like the sausage, uh, the sausage factory. More and more Marx's words actually ring true on, the, on, on, the, on, on this score. But the key criteria isn't that people engage in production of material uh, commodity. The point is that there is a labour process, that some of the surface value is captured by capital, and so on and so forth. Again, it's an anecdotal example, but I, after I graduated, spent six months working in a, as a software engineer in a small consultancy, a very, very high-tech company, um, you know, simply uh, engaged in, in, in producing software, a very mental, intellectual process, but it was absolutely clear that you were being exploited. You would sit at a desk for nine hours a day, actually, in my case, eight hours a day, because I'd sneak, I'd insist I'd get my one hour to go and sit in the canteen and read uh, Lukash. But um, for most people, sit at a desk for nine hours a day, creating a, a, an immaterial commodity, some software, and at the end of the day, you could calculate how much profit the company had made, how much you were getting paid, and, and, and you could see the difference. It's absolutely clear there's a process of exploitation uh, underlying uh, this relationship. Uh, Hart and Negri go on to argue that the this is again a quote, that the labour process have changed, and this is what they say, the central forms of produ productive cooperation are no longer created by the capitalist as part of the project to organise labour, but rather emerge from the productive energies of labour itself. There's no role for capital or the manager in this process, it comes spontaneously from the creative process from below. This leads to some of the most astonishing passages in Empire and Multitude, in which there are descriptions of the labour process that will be completely unrecognisable to anyone who's engaged in a real labour process. Let me quote two of them. Here's the first one. See if you recognise this from your own work. A gigantic cultural revolution is underway. Free expression and the joy of bodies. The autonomy, hybridisation and the reconstruction of languages, the creation of new, singular, mobile modes of production. All this emerges everywhere and continually. I've never done a job that's been anything, anything like that description. Uh, second one, uh, everywhere corporations are anxious to include differences within their realm, 
and thus aim to maximise creativity, free play and diversity. The daily routine of the workplace should be rejuvenated with unexpected changes and an atmosphere of fun. Break down the old boundaries and let a hundred flowers bloom. Absolutely unrecognisable to modern workers. Uh, I'm going to argue a little bit later on that the reality is the opposite. That more and more spheres of work have become subject to the intensification of labour, the managerial pressure of labour, bullying, exploitation and so on. That the kind of relationships Marx identifies and outline are more and more commonplace across society uh, as a whole. Think of what's happened in large retail warehouses, in the large banks and the universities and so on. These are more and more common techniques that have been brought in. Uh, finally, the, these techniques are normally executed in conventional workplaces. Not necessarily the mills and factories and mines, but the logic of, of forming contemporary workplaces. We have to go back to Marx and the question of the formal and real subsumption of labour under capital. Why does capital bring workers together in the workplace? Two reasons. First of all, to coordinate the collective labour labourer. Um, this is um, the way that Carcady describes it in his writings in the 1970s. Coordination of the collective labour on the one hand uh, in order to uh, produce. Secondly, surveillance and control. Both of these things require bringing workers together, watching over them, centralising the labour process and so on. And that's why both processes that take place today tend to be enacted in large-scale, organised workplaces uh, where workers are drawn together with management and the means of, means of production. Okay. Let me turn now to a second uh, a popular attempt to theorise the changes. This is the work of Guy Standing, um, which enjoyed a sort of brief celebrity status in Britain. I think because he was the first person to write a, a long book with the word precariat uh, in its title. It's a terrible book, don't buy, don't buy it. Um, but but it, was a, it was an attempt to try and grapple with, it, with, it, with this notion. Um, like uh, Hart and Negri, but even more explicitly in the case of, uh, of Standing, Standing's account of, uh, of the proletariat is based on an incredibly restrictive and historically specific definition. Um, he one, at one point describes them as a shrinking core of manual employees. And furthermore, he, he talks about the proletariat as being, as being dependent on, and this is a quote, a society consisting mostly of workers in long-term, stable, fixed-hour jobs with established routes of advancement, unionisation and collective agreements, with job titles their fathers and mothers would have understood. Think how enormously restrictive that is as a definition of the proletariat. Uh, in Marx's day, it probably applied to maybe 4 or 5% of the labour force, certainly not the workers in textile mills that Marx talks about in the 1860s, uh, certainly not the vast majority of people in the working class uh, anywhere really in the, in the, 19th, uh, the 19th century. It's based on a very narrow conception of the working class, uh, fixated on a certain period uh, of history. Because of his, the weakness of his definitions, and Standing's definitions are much closer to a sort of Weberian account focusing on occupation, on labour, capital labour, um, the exchange between capital labour and uh, status, conditions of employment and so on. Because of the weakness of his definition, uh, Standing never, I, I think in the entire book, he never actually describes anyone as being a member of the precariat. Everyone is near the precariat, close to the precariat, linked to the precariat, at risk of joining the precariat. The, these are the kind of formulations that occur again and again throughout the book. It's a sort of very, very loose uh, conceptual apparatus here. Nonetheless, he says this is on page 24 of the book, we, we may guess at present, we may guess at present, that in many countries at least a quarter of the adult population is in the precariat. It doesn't say which countries or which quarter of the population, but this is, you know, proof by assertion. Again, like Hart and, Hart and Negri. Let me give you some more concrete examples from Standing. His, his four, four or five concrete examples of groups that he identifies as being close to the precariat. Page 14. Most of those who find themselves in temporary jobs are close to being in the precariat. 
conventional uh, form formulation. Secondly, another avenue into the precariat is part-time employment. I'll come back to this in a moment because the uh, attempt to conflate temporary and part-time employment is a theme of much of this writing. You lump these different forms of employment together and say it's all non-standard, so it must all be precarious. I'll examine that point later on. That's page 15. Page 16. Another group linked to the precarious is a growing army uh, in call centres. That's another quote. Then he goes on page 20, quotes a woman uh, social worker on a £28,000 uh, salary who is denied promotion and told that no posts were available and was doing lots of work in her own time. This is Guy Standing, I'm quoting. This woman is linked to the precariat by lack of progression and her appreciation of it. She was self-exploiting doing more work for labour. Huge numbers of people fit this description. And then he adds in, everyone in the export processing zones in Malaysia, and many adds in the entire Chinese working class. Uh, this is a, a method of absolutely wild conflation of quite different groups which deserve to be examined in their own right to form this, this completely incoherent mass of people who then turned the precariat. So let me just finally give my favourite quote from Guy Standing, page 16. Those who are dependent on others for allocating them to tasks over which they have little control are at greater risk of falling into the precariat. Has anyone ever done a job where they don't have someone allocating jobs to them over which they have no control? This is absolutely incoherent intellectually. It's a conceptual mess uh, founded on a sort of semi-Weberian but very loose notion of what class, uh, what class is. Let me, rather than saying more about Guy Standing, uh, let me turn now to try to look at some of the changes that have taken place in the last 20 or 30 years. Because it's one thing to say that these um, understandings of class are incoherent, we have to propose something better. And the starting point for us has to be, as I said before, uh, an account of class which, which begins, I think, with the social relations of production. That we see class not as a thing, but as a relationship, that classes uh, stand in a relationship to other classes and in a relationship to the means of production. And these relationships are dynamic, they're changing, but they're structured by these basic relationships uh, between groups of people and, the relation, uh, and their relationship to the, uh, to the means of production. Uh, characteristic, characteristically under capitalism, that you have a minority group that have effective control, and often ownership of the means of production, uh, and you have a mass of people who are deprived ownership and control of the means of production, and by virtue of that they have to go and work for a capitalist, and in the process of working, their, labor, uh, their uh, labor, capacity to labour is hired, and some of the labour, some of the value that they create is appropriated by a capitalist. It's the essential fundamental relationship in capitalism. Secondly, in order to uh, uh, develop uh, within capitalism, it develops a characteristic labour process in which capital and labour are drawn together, uh, typically within the workplace, and within this process in which ca uh, capital and labour, in which technology and labour are drawn together, you get the formation of the collective worker, the collective worker drawing together different uh, types of work within a single overall process of production. And secondly, as I mentioned before, there's a process of control and surveillance. Often a process of delegated uh, by the capitalist to a, a bureaucratically uh, organised hierarchy uh, of managers and supervisors who occupy a position, an ambiguous position between capital and labour within the labour process. You form uh, probably something around 10 or 15% of the labour force uh, under capitalism. I think this came up in, in Tibor's uh, presentation, uh, presentation earlier. Now, what can we say about the changes over the, first, the last 30, 20 or 30 years? Uh, the first and most obvious uh, trend that's apparent is the uh, relative decline of the number of people employed in manufacture in most developed countries. Uh, I, should, I should say, incidentally, I know this is called class in the periphery. Uh, I'm going to talk mainly about class in the, in the core, uh, if you accept that terminology. I'm going to focus on Britain and America. I make no apology for that because the, the kind of claims that I'm looking at 
uh, are very focused on those very advanced and developed uh, economies on Britain and America. So I'm going to look at those economies in particular. Um, across those economies, the decline in manufacturing employment uh, is, is absolutely irrefutable, and the relative growth of employment in the service sector, uh, also in the public sector, in financial services, and a whole range of other spheres. The first thing I want to say about this is, is that this is not an epiphenomena of neoliberalism. There isn't something that's come along called neoliberalism that's magically transformed us and taken away manufacturing and replaced it with services. I'm not saying that hasn't happened in, in, in the neoliberal period, but we have to understand that the roots of this process go back to the process of production itself and to trends that Marx himself identified. The most important is what Marx called the rising organic composition of capital, the displacement of living labour by dead labour within the uh, process of labour itself. Um, the displacement of living labour from workplace and replacement with dead labour. Uh, that's a very long-term trend within capitalism. Uh, in the case of America, it's identified by uh, Harry Braverman again in, in 1974, if you read Labour and Monopoly Capitalism, it's one of the points that he makes in that, in that book long before the advent of uh, what's called uh, the neoliberal period. Uh, in, in the case of Britain, manufacturing employment peaked in 1871 as a share of the labour force. Uh, sorry, service sector employment overtook manufacturing employment in 1871. Manufacturing employment as a share of total employment peaks in 1911, uh, tends to decline after that, and declines fairly steadily from 1960 onwards, out, out of this process of the rising organic composition uh, of capital. What that means is not necessarily that there's less manufacturing happening. Uh, Jane talked about that this this morning. But it means that the same output can be created with smaller uh, numbers uh, of, uh, of workers. One obvious consequence of that is that quite small groups of workers within the manufacturing sector can end up with colossal power centralised in, 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 in their hands. Uh, a couple of examples. In uh, 2008, the strike in um, the Axel plant by 3,500 workers supplying General Motors shuts down the whole continental production line for General Motors across uh, North, North America. 3,500 workers did that. Uh, secondly, the strike, a very famous strike by uh, Boeing um, machinists the same year, cost uh, Boeing £100 million a day, shut down manufacturing as far away as France and Japan. Uh, the engine plant in East London, in Ford, uh, Ford Dagenham, shut, could shut down van production, begin to shut down uh, van production across the whole of Europe in about six, seven uh, hours because of just in time production methods. In other words, these Factors that expel labour from manufacturing can also leave groups of workers in a very powerful position. Secondly, even with the decline of, of, of the uh, huge uh, manufacturing workplaces, the shrinkage of manufacturing employment and the uh, disappearance of some of the very large-scale manufacturing plants, we shouldn't accept the argument that, that workplaces are any smaller than they were in the past. Yes, the workplaces have changed, uh, yes, they're often in different sectors, but what's quite astonishing, certainly if you look at the American figures, is the continuity of workplace size. Between uh, 1980 and 2007, the percentage of workers in, in workplaces of 1,000 or more workers went from 14% to 13%. Stayed almost constant. The percentage of workers in workplaces of 100 or more people rose from 74% to 75%. The vast majority of American workers were in workplaces of 100 plus uh, workers. Incidentally, the textile workers of the 1840s in Lancashire, the heartlands of chartism, these workplaces on average, according to the figures I calculated, had uh, about 137 workers within them. Uh, in the grand historical scheme of things, we're not seeing the decline of the large-scale uh, large workforces uh, that Marx talked about and later writers talked about. The third trend is as uh, workers are, are expelled from manufacturing, they tend to accumulate in other areas of the economy, uh, notably in the service sector and so on. Um, these workers become a new, a new potential source of class, uh, a class power. 
Why are they a source of class power? Because they're engaged in, in large collective workplaces as part of a collective labourer. They're subject to the indignities and oppression uh, and exploitation that workers face more generally. And large numbers of these workers are productive workers by any Marxist, any real Marxist criteria. They produce surplus value, and that surplus value is appropriated by the capitalists, and therefore if they withhold their labour, uh, the capitalists can no longer obtain that surplus value in the form, in the form of profit. Uh, it's true even in retail. Uh, if you read Marx carefully, it's clear that within retail there are formal acts like bookkeeping and working a cash register, which don't actually create any new value, but they're part of a collective worker that does. Uh, activities such as moving goods around, warehousing, preserving the value of goods and so on, these are uh, processes that feed into the use value of the commodity and therefore are bound up in creating and preserving value and therefore their surplus value generating activities. Uh, there's lots of other areas, public tra uh, private transport companies, uh, those working in, in, in restaurants and cafes who produce food and so on and so forth. These, these are clearly productive uh, activities. Even those workers who are not directly productive, uh, by withholding their labour, can often hit the profits of those who employ them. The obvious example is bank workers. Uh, within a Marxist analysis, people who work in banking uh, don't uh, generate surplus value. They appropriate some of the surplus value, a share of the surplus value generated in the productive uh, areas of the economy. The problem is that in order to appropriate that surplus value, the, the banking capitalist uh, has to employ people. And if those people cease to work, it's not a question of creating new value, but the capitalist can't appropriate that, that value which forms the profit of the banking sector or what have you. Uh, large groups of workers are in that position. The fourth trend I want to talk about briefly is the, uh, something that's very um, clear in a number of developed uh, economies, the growth of the public sector. Uh, and in the public sector today, um, some workers are engaged in the process of generating surplus value because large chunks of it have been privatised and outsourced and so on. Uh, not all workers in the public sector are value-creating, productive, uh, productive workers. Uh, nonetheless, there have been quite important changes uh, to work in the public sector that I think are worth looking at. Uh, first of all, let, let's first acknowledge that public sector workers do hold some power. In 2011, the strike which Zizek was so dismissive of, the government's own figures show that that strike cost £2.5 billion, pounds, a one-day strike cost £2.5 billion to the economy simply through the fact that it shut down schools and therefore parents had to look after their kids at home and it caused immense disruption and so on. Uh, we shouldn't accept the argument that workers have no power in the public sector. Perhaps more importantly than that, these are workers who typically today, certainly in the case of Britain, probably more likely than private sector workers to be organised, are typically in large workplaces and have shown a, a degree of militancy uh, in in recent years. If you look at Britain, uh, we've had in the last couple of weeks in Britain the declaration of a strike ballot uh, among uh, the, the local government workers, a very large section of the workforce, uh, health workers uh, are balloting for strike action, the fire brigade union uh, are talking about going on strike, section of the civil service, the teachers will hold a one day strike and so on. This is in a period of very, very low levels of industrial action. The public sector is actually the most militant uh, section in Britain. If these groups of workers uh, break through and win victories, even limited victories, it has an enormous impact on the wider work working class. Uh, finally, in terms of the relationship between different groups of workers, um, one of the trends over the last 30 years has been what's often called the proletarianisation of these workers. By that, people don't mean that their objective class position has changed, so much as that these workers, because of the degradation that's imposed on them because of the techniques that are brought into the workplace and so on, uh, tend to identify much more with working class people generally. They tend to see their conditions of existence as being uh, in parallel with productive uh, workers, with historically manufacturing workers and workers in the, private, in the private sector. The final thing that's worth mentioning about the public sector is that it reflects another trend as well, which is the, the final thing I want to talk about, which is the growing importance to capitalism 
of acquiring the right, right forms of, of labour power in the right place at the right time. Why have we seen a massive expansion of healthcare, education, uh, infrastructural services and so on? Not through the altruism of capitalism. Not because they're giving us something because, because um, they're, 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 they're generous. It's because the preoccupation with having labour that is sufficiently healthy, sufficiently educated, has the correct kinds of skills that capital, capitalism can hire, has become a central preoccupation. It's always been a preoccupation of capitalism, but it's an even more central preoccupation today, I would say, than 50 or 100, 100 years ago. And it brings me to the final uh, point I want to make about the arguments about class today, which is the degree to which workers have or haven't become precarious in modern capitalism. Has there been a fundamental shift in the capital-labour relationship that's rendered workers uh, precarious in a way that they weren't in the past? And there's two arguments that um, should be made uh, about this. The first is made by um, Brian, I think it's Brian Palmer, in a very good uh, article in uh, the latest Socialist, uh, Socialist Register, which is a, a sort of long historical argument, which is really to say that capital by its very nature, renders workers precarious relative to capital. Uh, you go right back to the German ideology, and there's a passage in which Marx explicitly says workers are precarious relative to capital. There is an imbalance in the power relationship between capital and labour most of the time, in which capital holds the whip hand. So, in the broad sense of things, yes, uh, workers are, are precarious in the capital labour relationship. Are workers today more precarious? than, for example, workers in the East End of London in the 1880s. The workers on the dock side who used to queue up every morning, desperate for work, and could be hired or fired at the drop of a hat by their, by their employee. Is it really true that workers are in that degree uh, a precariousness today? I would argue that almost all workers in the developed world are less precarious than most workers in the 1880s or 18, 1840s. That's the first argument. The second and more interesting argument, though, is has, within those limits, has there been a fundamental and general shift in the position of labour? And here I want to draw on the fantastically good writings by uh, Kevin Dugan, who produced a book, I don't know if it's available here, it's called uh, New Capitalism, with a question mark at the end, New Capitalism question mark. Uh, and it's questioning uh, a lot of the assumptions about how capitalism has changed in the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, 20 or 30 years. And the key point that, that Kevin Dugan makes is that uh, capitalist labour markets, because capital is also dependent on labour power and, and the right kinds of labour power, labour markets don't simply perfectly conduct changes to technology uh, through the working class. Labour markets are also powerful insulators of changes to technology, they tend to uh, insulate workers to an extent against the transformations uh, in, in, in the means of production that go on all, all, all the time uh, under, under capitalism. Uh, and in some ways, Dugan points out, the dependency of capital on, on labour has grown. Um, it, it's very apparent if you look at the bits of the service sector that uh, capitalists in catering, uh, in, who, who run small cafes and so on, are absolutely obsessed with getting the right kind of staff to work with them. Workers in these spheres are seen, spheres are seen as eminently disposable and so on. Actually, if an, if an employer can get a worker who's good at customer service, who's educated to the right level, who can uh, keep uh, tabs on the cash flow through the business, who can speak one or two languages and deal with tourists and so on, they are concerned to hold on to this labour. It's not true that people view these things as, as completely disposable. Uh, and what Dugan points out is if you look at the empirical data, you can't make any sweeping claims of this kind. Let me give you a few of the figures. Uh, first of all, temporary working. Uh, across the OECD as a whole, uh, temporary uh, contracts uh, from 1985 to 2000, so the high point of neoliberalism, went from 10% to 12%. Very, very small increases. Uh, in the US, uh, for which many of the strongest claims are made, uh, it fell during the same period, ending up at about one job in 20 with a temporary contract. If you look at 
um, the degree of involuntary temporary working in Britain uh, in 2008, it was running at 1.4% of the, of the total workforce. 1.4% of the total workforce. I'm not saying it's not terrible if you're in a temporary job, but we have to have some sense of the scale on which this is happening in different economies. There are other economies in which far more people are employed in temporary work, but it's not a universal trend across the developed uh, capitalist uh, e economies. Not only that, but if you look at long-term employment, if you look at job tenure, job tenure seems to be growing rather than diminishing in a whole number of economies. Um, I'll give you some figures. Dugan has an absolutely encyclopedic uh, look at this in, in, in his book. But if you look at the 10 or all the 20 years running to 2002, in the OECD economies, including the US, in many of those economies, job tenure, the length of time people stay in employment grows. I can get you the figures if you want, want it. But it's simply not true that workers are having a more tenuous relationship with an employee. Of course there are variations. Of course there are attempts by, by employers to bring in temporary working. Particularly prevalent in the UK, and I believe it's, it's the same here in academia. Perhaps one of the reasons why academics write so much about temporary work in Britain is because the conditions in academia are actually quite unusual across the world, particularly for young uh, academics who are trying to, get, trying to get a job. Okay. Uh, final point, I'd like to finish on, on this. If it's true that the trends towards precariousness are very uneven and there isn't a sweeping general transformation of, of capital labour relationships, we should pause to ask why is it that almost universally in capitalism, including in, in economies where it's not the case, workers believe they're becoming more precarious. Talk to any worker pretty much in Britain or America and they'll tell you I, I, I'm becoming more precarious. Um, a weaker relationship to the labour market and so on and so on and so forth. Why is there the, the, the disparity between people's conception and the reality of precariousness? And I think there are a couple of reasons. The first and most obvious reason is because we, we have been living through uh, a period of 20 or 30 years in which the level of sustained struggle by workers from below in the workplace, sustained struggle from below, has been incredibly limited. The level of self-organisation, of activity in the work, work, workplace, uh, strike activity and so on, driven from below in a sustained manner, has been very low. Certainly in Britain and many other economies uh, 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 as well. In that context, what, what was once called the frontier of control between capital and labour shifts. And it brings me to a second point, which is the capacity of managers and employers to push labour around inside the workplace grows. And the logic for many people is if my boss can push me around in the workplace, they can push me out the door as well. Uh, the logic is that people feel disposable, they feel vulnerable, they feel under attack, they feel like, and the reality is that work is intensifying, that exploitation has been ratcheted up and so on. That can leave people feeling far more precarious than they are in actuality. To go back to something that Jane talked about this morning, a very interesting survey of outsourcing in America it showed that there was a systematic disparity between workers thinking their job was moving to China or India or somewhere else and the actual reality. There's a huge gap between perception and reality when it comes to these measures of precarity and so on. In conclusion now, therefore, to try and draw this picture to a close, I think we have to acknowledge that there have been large-scale changes to work, to the structure of employment, to the labour process and the capitalism, and so on. But these are transformations within the framework of capitalist relations of production, but not transformations of the capitalist relations of production. There hasn't been a fundamental transformation of those things. And because that's true, the, the, the structural capacities, the powers uh, granted to workers that Marx identified, which were bound up with those social relationships, still exists. The structural de dependence of capital on labour, the potential power of workers to obstruct uh, profit making through collective a action, the drawing together of workers in relatively homogeneous conditions in large scale workplaces, these are all elements of the situation today. If that's, if that's still intact, what is missing from the picture? What's missing from the picture, far more than the structural capacities of workers, are the elements of organisation, politics and ideology. 
These are elements that the left, I think, does have to focus on and address. In doing so, we have to be clear there is no magic bullet. There's a constant searching on the left for this, this magic, magic trick that will perform, and suddenly workers will be confident and fight and so on. It's not that simple. But I think we have to understand that as new class forces develop in society, as workers come into being with no experience of struggle and no experience of organisation, it takes time. And what Hal Draper, uh, in his great uh, survey of Marx's view on class, talks about as the, mat the maturation, the maturing of new class forces. It takes time and experience of struggle, either building up gradually or for explosion, explosive outbursts of struggle, to begin to forge for new class forces that can transform the situation. But the basic argument that Marx made in the Holy Family in uh, the early, um, in the, in the mid-1840s uh, still holds true. To quote Marx, it is not a question of what this or that proletarian, or even the whole proletariat at the moment regards as its aim. It's a question of what the proletariat is, and what in accordance with this being, it will be historically compelled to do. That historical basis for proletarian uh, self-emancipation still holds true today. We have to understand the challenges facing us, in particular the betrayals of Stalinism and social democracy, the two most powerful socialist currents of the 20th century, have created a situation which very few of those radicalising automatically look to socialism or workers' struggle uh, as, as the uh, basis for self-emancipation today. But it means that we have to, first of all, engage with those struggles that are really happening, Secondly, we have to be prepared to patiently explain the, the, the continued capacity of workers to resist their exploitation despite their relatively low levels of struggle. And thirdly, we have to polemicise against the fashionable views which dismiss class and dismiss the basis of class power today. Joseph, for transforming your panel presentation into a full blown lecture. Um, okay, so again, we have about 60 minutes for discussion. Uh, raise your hand and we'll bring you the mics, questions, comments. Mm -hmm. We can take a couple of questions uh, at a time, so uh, after this one is uh, over, please again raise your hands. Thank you for your presentation and uh, I think it was um, somehow uh, optimistic uh, presentation. Basically what you're saying is that don't worry, conditions are still there, but we need basically a little bit more organization and a little bit more uh, ideological work on the left. Um, and you gave this nice example with the, the power of workers that uh, still exists. But to be honest, that my question is, is this, uh, to what extent this somehow optimistic is uh, derived from your uh, data, from your empirical data, mainly this US UK uh, focus and to uh, a little bit large extent this OECD uh, set of uh, data. Because I mean I see your, your point uh, to a certain extent that okay uh, we shouldn't um, fall into this trap of uh, I don't know uh, creative capitalism and everything and so on. I'm not so sure about the criticism of uh, precariat. But to a certain extent, I see, I see the point that uh, we should uh, uh, not fall into this uh, fashionable uh, um, ideas today. But at the same time, you can look at empirical evidence that will bring exa exactly the contrary of what you're saying. I mean, for example, in Europe, we still have 50% of uh, people under 35 unemployed. Right? I mean, this is a fact. So it can be, I don't know, can be put into this perspective that, okay, uh, labor is absolutely becomes redundant to uh, capital. Then I can give a lot of examples from post-communist Eastern Europe, right? The, the dramatic uh, fall of uh, working class that I'm manufacturer, I mean, is so well uh, documented uh, by now. Then you can look at this uh, uh, neoliberal reform. We talked about temporary contracts. The, the, the increase in temporary contracts in Eastern Europe is, uh, has probably doubled uh, in, in the last uh, years. And I can go on and on. I mean, you can look in other uh, areas as well, uh, Southeast Asia. You, basically, capitalism works there with uh, military. You, you production there, to a large extent, is organized uh, with the military. Uh, Latin America as well, strikes are, are met again with uh, 
So, to a certain extent, I mean, to what extent your vision is based on this somehow um, regional uh, focus, and to what extent you should really take into account this global perspective of capitalism, which might create some sort of islands of powerful worker mobilization somewhere, but a lot of dispossession, precariousness, whatever you want to call it, uh, in many other uh, parts of the world. Any other questions? Uh, I have to uh, disagree with you on, on your claim that uh, the workers working in a retail, uh, say truck drivers or workers working in warehouses, produces value that they are somehow <coughs> also uh, 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 also part of the process of creation of the surface value. I think in that uh, position we see them in this classic Marx formula of MCM. So the second dimension and their function is to, uh, to low, lower the, the cost of the realization process, the process of realization of the surface value. Because when the surface value is reduced, if there are some other costs, there is, it's not, uh, let's say, uh, standing in the warehouse for long, a longer time than it's, it's a plan. And uh, such, such progress, I think they're not producing or adding in some kind of value to already produced uh, white, but they are just, their function is, is, is to to, uh, to speed up the process of realization and to realize all the uh, uh, surplus value produced in the production process uh, as much as possible. Another question, Gal? Thanks for the lecture. I would also join to, with one of the remarks that already Florin made and also made me a little bit skeptical, not so much about the data, but when you talk about the precarious, even if I kind of agree with your push of criticizing Harta Negri and the guy standing who should be also maybe named now Fallen, I would like to say uh, that um, your analysis didn't provide much about the target or like the transformation that happened also in the core countries and that's the, the fall of the welfare state. So in a sense there is like a very, you don't have to gather all this kind of data and so on, but the level of protection of socio-economic rights in the West, but also in the East or on the periphery, has been tremendous. So these effects are clear, and this I've been a little bit missing in your otherwise well-constructed analysis. And secondly, where I, my ears just like went a little bit um, higher, or how you say it, it's where you made a kind of distinction between the perceptions and the reality in a way that how certain perception cannot be or are so, so much in disparity with the reality. But as Marx already said, these perceptions are very well integrated into reality, are a part of this reality. So this is also a part of, let's say, ideological class struggle that is going on but have also material basis. So here, not just the UK, US, but you know, all these kind of post operist thinkers, no matter how critical we should be of them, but there has been a really good analysis done on the level of outsourcing, subcontracting, a lot of family business, and what has happened to fiat is something that cannot just like diminish, okay the working size of the companies, what you were saying, there is still 100 or 132 and so on and so on. So like there has been a transformation or a reorganization of industrial capacities. So it's not that there has been just like the move to the industrialization. I agree with you that we have to be skeptical about that. But there has been a move in reorganizing the capital. Tony has another question, but maybe Joseph would like to answer first. Yeah. Okay, we'll take another round of questions later. Let me try to come back on those, I'll probably forget some. Um, on the question of the creation of sur surplus value, uh, I mean, I just don't agree. My, my reading of Marx is, is different, it's heavily shaped by Kalkady, and maybe someone can ask him again tomorrow. But my view of it is that those um, activities that involve transporting commodities where it feeds into the final use value are value generating, it's part of the commodity that's being sold. Other activities that are superfluous, 
um, or um, involve uh, unnecess unnecessary movement of goods between different markets and so on are not productive. So you, you can make a distinction between these things. Um, the, the distinction I was making though is between the formal activities of circulation, working in a cash register and so on, these, these are purely formal activities, these are clearly not productive within a Marxist conception. The other activities, I think we have to have a concrete analysis and we have to distinguish between those which are productive uh, and, and those that aren't productive. So I think it's just a different reading uh, uh, of capital on, on, on that score. Um, on the welfare state, yeah, yes, it's true there have been massive attacks on the welfare state, privatisation uh, is one of them, the erosion of some of the services, uh, and so on. I think that's all true, and everyone I think, accepts and acknowledges that that's been a feature for the last 20 or 30 years. One of the things that's quite astonishing, though, is the degree to which um, no government has tried to eradicate large chunks of the welfare state. They might have changed it to try and commercialise it, commodify it, generate a profit out of it, but no government is talking about eradicating the health service or eradicating the education system and so on. So I think we have to understand the limits to this, and the limits lie in the necessity for capital to generate the right kinds of labour power. Uh, so I think that's an important limit on the ability to erode uh, welfare and so on. But I agree there are wider political and, and ideological things that are incredibly important that I didn't have time to, uh, to, 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 to speak about. On the two, two of the concrete points you, you make, you, you say that perceptions have a material basis. I agree, I tried to explain why um, people might perceive their position in this way. Uh, it's just that the material basis for perception doesn't lie in the um, weakening of the relationship between capital and labour, in my view. It lies in other material bases. Uh, is this a material factor? Is the perception a material factor? Of course it is. Uh, as Hegel said, ideas become a material force when they grip the masses. Uh, absolutely it's a material force feeding into a class struggle. That's why uh, I think it's important that we challenge some of the conceptions. Of course, the, the single biggest challenge to the perceptions will be class struggle itself. Um, and maybe I'll, 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 I'll come back to that. Um, I, I agree there has been a reorganisation of capitalism. Uh, I think it's important to say that that's, uh, there have been many reorganisations of capitalism in the past. Uh, is it as big as the transition from the... Um, the early industrial industrialisation, say in Britain in the 1840s and 1850s, to the development of heavy industry in the 1880s and 1890s. It's, it's on a similar scale, but it, I'm, not, I'm not sure it's incomparably greater than those kind of transitions. And out of that reorganisation of, of production, you do get the emergence of new class forces, uh, and so on and so forth. So I agree there's been substantial reorganisation. I just think we have to be careful about the uh, scale on which it takes place and, and, and the claims we make about it. Let me come back to the question of, 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 of globalisation, because it, it, it's a perfectly uh, reasonable and, and, and valid point. Um, I think I would make two uh, points. The first point is that there isn't a correlation between the degree of, if you like, the degree to which workers have been rendered weak, precarious and so, and so on, and the degree to which they fight. I mean, you give the example of Latin America. When I think of Latin America, I think of the place which certainly until the Arab revolutions, was the heartland of anti-capitalist struggle for many, many years. Um, despite the transformations that have taken place, which have in some ways weakened labour in countries like Bolivia, Venezuela, Brazil, and so on. Um, so there's no correlation, no direct correlation between the two, and that's a very important point. It's a historical point as well, I made, that's why they made the point about workers in the 19th century. These were in much weaker positions, but they were the basis for powerful movements like the Chartists, uh, the new union, union movement in the 1880s, 1890s in Britain, and so on and so forth. Uh, secondly, I, I'm not arguing that you have this core working class in Britain and America, and everywhere else people are in a weak position. That's not my position. Um, even the uh, complicated and contradictory processes of capitalist development, uh, even in the uh, areas of the global south which have been deeply impoverished, and underdeveloped in recent years by capitalism, you get the formation of new class forces. Let me give you a really obvious example. Part of the Chinese boom has been to develop networks of quarrying and mining across uh, regions of southern and eastern Africa. Uh, what's one of the most militant, uh, explosive and important struggles in recent decades? The Marikana miners. 
more widely in the mining industry in South Africa. Uh, an incredibly explosive struggle by a group of workers in, a, in, in very difficult circumstances who suddenly find themselves in a powerful position because of these new networks of capitalist production that have developed in recent, in recent decades. It's a mixed and contradictory, uh, contradictory position. Even in those areas in which there's been massive um, urbanization without very much industrialization, you get an amalgam of people who have quite stable formal jobs in quite a relatively powerful position, and those people in, in informal labor, and informal labor is a horrible um, concatenation of different groups of workers, some of whom work very traditional jobs, some of whom sell goods by the side of It's not a real category, but you get a, a mixing together of these kind of group, groups of people. It's a very interesting study of Soweto done, which showed that even though a minority of people are in formal employment, most people were in a household alongside someone who was in formal employment. Even in those situations, some kind of basis for class unity exists. So yes, I am optimistic in the grand historical sense. I'm also very clear that we face huge challenges, but yes, I have an optimism about the overall position of workers under capitalism. Thank you. Another line of questions? Tony? Uh, I like, same like that, I, I had no problem with your uh, critique of uh, Harvey Negri and Guy Sanding, but, but I somehow think we're missing the, uh, it's a wrong target uh, for us here, we should have an internal debate about uh, Marx's concept of the class and why are we missing the perception that workers do get. And uh, the difference, I think you've, you've acknowledged that there is a perception of reality, there are, there are those things that seem in disparity. But it seems to me you've emphasized that we need to look at the classes in relation to uh, forces of production and mode of production and in relation to the, their own relation to the means of production. So you, you put forward some classical Marxist uh, points, how do we think class, which is all good. Uh, but what I think is missing, and I'm curious, what, what your view is, is uh, that this, we do live in a, in a mixed uh, production, uh, in, in a mixed Economies, if you want. I mean, not, not in the rest of the world, but in, in the certainly in the economies you're looking at, where you know we have 35 percent of GDP spent by the state in US and in UK even more so, and a lot of that, if you even take away the pensions, goes to goods and services outputs allocated to need health, education, like you said, housing. Even though it's gone down in UK, there's still significant chunk allocated. So that is also production. It's not production in classical Marxist terms. Uh, with you at the beginning, but it does produce capability at minimum, you know, of labor power to. Uh, so it's a it's an enormous wealth, not in form of commodities being circulated. It has its monetary value. There is labor. There is wage labor. You know, it uses a lot of technology. It's based on taxes, enormous taxes, and and none of that was part of uh, what you presented. And still, like Al said. Uh, not only is acquiring our chunk of social wage that we think we're entitled to in UK, for example, not only is that so hard that you feel precarious, therefore when you lose your job, you know that it's not going to be easy to stay on a door or a house in Benham, but also the duration of employment is data that you haven't mentioned. I've looked at it a long time ago, so I'm not sure. I know it drastically went down, but I don't know how drastically, so it might have not gone down as drastically as, as my memory uh, uh, have remembered. But, uh, it seems to me that what we don't have on, on Marxist uh, side of uh, theorists is a coherent picture of why is this perception of weakness of labor to workplace happen, you know, what are its causes, and how social wage contributes to it, how our entitlement and acquiring of social wage plays part in feeling precarious and therefore not joining the union, therefore not battling, therefore not seeing political side as something that can change anything. Uh, so I think while your critique is, I think, valid, uh, we don't have the other side, which is the internal Marxist uh, uh, theorizing of why the workers feel precarious. Because I think if you feel preca precarious, you act in a way which is not combative, you don't struggle, you know, you just go from job to job to job. And eventually you lose uh, what you're trying to emphasize here, which is the ability to engage in political struggle. Anyone else? Thank you. Uh, I, of course, completely agree that class is not an imagined community, as the writers you mentioned think. Uh, but about this uh, answer 
about change being based upon empirical data, sociological data uh, of a structure changing or not changing. I think the much more crucial question than these structures is, do we have to enter the same struggles in the same way as we did 50 years ago? I think here with this question we'll find the answer uh, what the real changes are. More? Okay, Joseph, you can answer. Yeah. Then we try again. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll try, but I, I sort of, I sort of feel like I've given my answer to your question. But let me, let me try and try and restate it. Why do I think the perception exists of precariousness? I think fundamentally because of the change in balance between capital and labour in the workplace, which creates a perception of precariousness because of the incredibly low levels struggle over the last 30 years, and because of the intensification of managerial pressure of bullying and so on on, on, on workers. I think that's the fundamental reason. Uh, secondly, I think that coexists with a, um, the formation of new uh, sectors of the economy in which there's very little tradition of organising union organisation and so on. That, that probably doesn't help. Now, if, if, that's, if that's the central reason, um, what would transform that situation? The key thing that has always transformed working class consciousness on a mass scale has been the emergence of new struggles. Um, one of the things that I find quite frustrating on, on the left internationally is this kind of perception that we'll get all our, we'll, we'll sort everything out, we'll, get, we'll build this perfect left, and then there'll be struggles down, down the way. I agree actually much more with what the final person from the, from the floor was saying. There will be new struggles. The position of the proletariat within capitalism ensures at some point there will be new struggles. These struggles won't necessarily take the form, there will be commonalities with previous struggles, they won't mirror exactly the struggles of the 1970s. Uh, for example, we're not very likely to see the gradual build-up of struggles by manufacturing workers in Britain in the way you did uh, before the, uh, the, the big eruption of struggle in, 19, in 1972. The pattern of struggle is going to be very different. The, Workplaces in which struggle is centred will be very different. The forms of organisation will, will be different. And again, this is something we've seen again and again through history. It's not true that when workers created the Soviets in Russia in 1905, from below, everyone just looked around and said, this is brilliant, this is the... Actually, the position of the Bolsheviks in Petrograd was immense suspicion. This must be a Menshevik plot. We shouldn't get involved in this thing. Why is it going through the unions we control and the party organisations and so on? Struggle always throws up novelties. Uh, part of the job of the left is to understand those novelties, to grapple with them, and to theoretically begin to generalise them. But I'm not sure we can do this in abstraction from real struggles that, 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 that are taking place. The critical thing that will transform perceptions is a real uh, experience of struggle, and that has to be fundamental for us. I'm not arguing, just finally, I'm not arguing we sit around and wait for struggles to take place some fine day in the future. Struggles are already taking place, not at the level that we want and so on. Our job is to get involved in those struggles, to try and ensure that they win, to give them the solidarity they need, and to try to form a breakthrough and actually begin to shift uh, the balance of class forces. But it, it might be a long, arduous process to do that. Okay. Steve? So, one thing, um, learned, uh, more than once or twice, or I don't know, um, answered the question, okay, why is the perception of, of, uh, of precariousness? You explained by decline in union militants. But then the technological question, or historical question, being, uh, how do you explain that decline? And it is statistically quite obvious. And of course, there are some people who argue well because of increasing precarization, and that we're at, you know, risking a circular, a very circular argument. I'm not saying that that's a thing that we should probably here avoid. And, um, but one thing, maybe I'm not so sure um, whether I uh, uh, an, additional, that, an additional question. You say, um, uh, I agree, of course, with all the criticism about uh, this absurd concept of the uh, precariat of the new class and whatnot. Uh, but uh, um, I think one should distinguish that from the process of pre precarization, which, uh, which can also be read, uh, not in uh, in terms of, well, uh, uh, increasing um, in comparison to the immediate, to the high uh, 
period of the high welfare state, or as it is perceived, and, and an increasing um, with, with the withdrawal of welfare states, with com uh, commercialization and so forth, uh, that pushes workers in a more immediate uh, dependency or increased dependency on wages and on the market. And this is a, also a disciplinary mechanism, which also can can contribute to, to this uh, the, well to a weakening of you know but can also be the precarization as as a, as a, well uh, um, more uh, uh, more precarious conditions of reproduction. Not necessarily in terms of that I have no creative power as a worker to to uh, to act upon against capital. Of course, I mean every uh, that is by definition. I mean the capital relationship is mutually uh, dependent. The capital depends on labor. The, uh, labor blocks that. I mean, uh, you have illustrated this uh, empirically, but I don't think that anyone is really uh, arguing that, that uh, labor has lost the power to uh, potentially strike. The question is, uh, well, okay, okay, some people may be. Doing, um, but I think that um, with, with, with probably more interesting is does precarization refer to this uh, weakening, uh, more, more fragile conditions of reproduction in comparison to the welfare, to the types of welfare state? Because what you have, the historical examples you gave, of course, were the ones preceding uh, uh, that period. And I think one could then argue uh, that precarization is nothing, uh, nothing but a return to what has been historically the normality of productivity. Of that is uh, 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 an increase, uh, an increasing immediate dependency on the market, on the wage, and so on and so on. That that, that is to a large extent of uh, neoliberalism, or, or what we call neoliberalism, or uh, neoliberalization uh, has has uh, had as an effect. So maybe you agree with both. Jane. Um, I, I'd just like to, to use the example of what's happening in British universities as a, as a way of contributing to the debate. And I don't know if people know that, that Britain now has the most privatised universities in the world where students pay £9,000 every year just in fees. Not rent, not sandwiches, not books, but um, in terms of fees. And what that's meant is um, you know, a real commodification of education in a very dramatic way. And it relates to Joseph's quote about the, about the schoolmaster. Now there are three things that are quite interesting. The first one relates to uh, what uh, Tibor was talking about this morning, which is the idea of um, you know, whether or not people perceive that they're exploited. And it relates to the question about middle class, being middle class and status. Because the university's trade union, of which I'm on the national executive, are having a fight about our salaries. We've had six days of strikes, which are quite a lot, and we were about to start stopping marking students' work. Okay? in about a week's time. Every lecturer got a letter saying that if we didn't mark students' work, they would stop 100% of our salary. In other words, locking out lecturers. Now, when I went back to work, when people had received these letters, people were incredibly angry because they had no illusions that they were professionals. In fact, they were treated like the miners were, 30 years ago in, uh, in Britain. So really any um, veneer, any sort of pretense of being professional when you're threatened with having your entire salary taken away was very dramatic and people are, are very clear about, about that. The second one is on pointed about intensification. And what has gone along with commodifying education is a whole series of measurements. A whole series of measurements. So nearly every time you open your mouth to students, there's a questionnaire that goes around rating your performance. And if you score below a certain amount, you'll be in the office of your head of department you know, to talk about why you are more entertaining, why you don't give higher marks, and so on. And with regard to publishing, if you, in some universities, if you don't publish, and not only publish in the correct journals, 
than you are put on a teaching only contract, or if you're a bit older, you might simply get kicked out of your job. So that feeling of precarity is less to do with the fact that people feel afraid of being um, unemployed, but because they are constantly measured and, um, you know, again, because of the way things are commodified, there's, there's performance management. The third um, issue is to do with the confidence of workers. And you know, it comes back to a really important question of agency. Of agency, and that's the role of socialists. Is it possible to go into a workplace, into your university, and organise that anger? Or are people just going to feel angry in an individual way? And like they do quite often, we've got a very good case of uh, someone in telling, informing the entire university that they want the vice-chancellor to fuck off, which didn't go down uh, very well with the vice-chancellor. That's a very individual and like, angry response. But is there a collective response? And you know, again, where there are socialists, where there are activists, people can win victories. And the final question, of course, um, we haven't got time to talk about this, is what is the role of the, the trade union leadership? And actually, if workers aren't confident to fight, you can have trade union leaders who really treat their members as a stage army and are very timid about actually um, confronting, confronting, um, confronting bosses. And I think this is another important question about how a class turns for a class in itself into a class for itself. Do we have another question? Hmm? Uh, okay, uh, I have a short question. Um, I just wondered, uh, is it possible to uh, contextualize uh, your topic and your limitation in, the, in a direction to the gender perspective. Um, Marxist uh, feminist perspective is always dealt with the problem and the thesis of unproductive and productive labor, the precariousness, uh, the part-time jobs, um, uh, then you dealt something with uh, immaterial jobs. So um, what would be actually the, uh, how to put it, uh, some sort of um, understanding of the link between the current um, uh, class subjectivity and gender and the gender perspective. How would you put it? Because you mentioned lots of very interesting um, limitation uh, which are actually in the tradition of Marxist feminism as said, especially the lean production that you that you uh, somehow mentioned. Uh, that's a very big question, and uh, I probably have to think about the answer a little bit before. Um, maybe, maybe let me let me come back to that later on. Um, on, on a couple of the points that, that were made, are, are we see are we really seeing a return to capitalist, what you refer to as capitalist normality? Um, yes and no. There are some. Um, ways in which capitalism is beginning to conform to uh, capitalism from an earlier period. But I don't think we're going to see a, a reversion to 19th century type welfare organisations. I don't think we're going to see the return of what is called the night watchman state. There's a minimum state in, in Britain, in 19th, supposedly minimum state in 19th century in, in, in Britain. Um, the uh, ruling class are not attempting to remove all welfare provision full stop. Uh, nor is it true that state spending across the capitalist world has in general declined over the neoliberal period. In fact, it's stayed relatively stable in a whole number of countries. There are exceptions, of course. Uh, but it's not true that public sector spending as a whole has, has gone down. And some areas of the public sector have expanded from the neoliberal period. Um, if you look at uh, health provision in the UK, all kinds of problems, all kinds of attempts to privatise it and corporatise it and so on. It's also true that real-term spending on the NHS from 1997 to about uh, 2008 doubled, and the level of employment within that service in the public sector actually grew through, through that period. That doesn't mean it's brilliant and there aren't huge problems there, 
but we have to see these changes uh, in, in proportion. Um, what I think we're seeing is the partial reorganisation of the public sector and welfare. We're seeing uh, elements of commodification. Even that isn't all uh, universally in one direction. Uh, one example from Britain is that the rail network, which used to be public in the public hand, was, was privatised. You had a situation in which different private companies owned the, the tracks and owned, owned the, rail, uh, the trains going on the tracks. Uh, this resulted in, well, among other things, uh, catastrophic uh, collisions, uh, accidents and so on, which killed people, uh, but also huge um, financial problems and so on. Ultimately, rail track was put back into a public, uh, into a semi-public uh, body uh, again. So even here, it's not universally all in one direction. There can be problems with commodifying public services, which is uh, people discover that private companies are not always the best people at delivering uh, these services in the interests of what the wider uh, capitalist class. So that there are limits to it. Um, Secondly, there are attacks on elements of the welfare state that, that, that aren't really favourable to capital. Um, a lot of what we're seeing in Britain, and it's the same here, is a very calculated attempt to attack uh, things like de disability benefits in Britain, because most people in the ruling class simply don't see this as useful in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, raising profitability. Very, very nasty attacks on bits of the welfare state that are not beneficial to capital. Thirdly, we are seeing, though, as, as Jane said, uh, an intensification of work in the public sector and the import into the public sector, this is a longer trend of techniques previously used in the private sector. Uh, and it raises the question of how do you quantify labour in the public sector? How do you quantify the work that someone does in a university? Well, you can't do it in terms of physical output, really. So you do it in terms of targets, publication uh, assessments, and so on and so on and so forth. And this whole culture of target setting and performance monitoring and so on is one of the uh, huge sites of grievances and antagonisms that are developing uh, within, the working, within the working class. And it brings me to another point, which is that all, most of the things that people identify with neoliberalism, whether it's the decline of the welfare state, whether it's the uh, increasing sense that workers have mortgages, they can't afford to lose their jobs and so on, all of these things uh, can be true, but they can play out in different ways. They can either uh, create a perception among workers that they can't fight, or they can drive them into struggle. They can have either impact on workers. What is critical in this situation is actually workers' confidence. And I, I, I want to come back to this point because, uh, first of all, it's not simply a question of measuring union density. That's never been a very good index of struggle. I mean, union, union density in France has always been much, much lower than in Britain. The level of struggle in France historically over the last 20 years or so has been much, much higher than Britain. You can't simply read off from union density the level of struggle. But secondly, why, why, was, why has there been a catastrophic decline in union organisation? Um, well, because the massive wave of struggle that erupted really from the late 1960s and continued through to the early 1980s in, in, in many countries was ultimately contained by capital. The struggles were broken, uh, breaking their struggles uh, broke the confidence of that working class insurgency, uh, weakened organisation, often, certainly in the case of Britain, certainly in the case of America under Reagan, consciously weakened union organisation through breaking uh, organised groups of workers like the miners in Britain, air traffic control in America, and so on. Uh, and secondly, after the decline in working class confidence that came out of that process, there's a, been a long process of reorganisation of capital in which new sites of production uh, have, have developed, in which workers don't have an experience of struggle, an experience of organisation, and so on. I don't think it's very difficult to explain uh, the low levels of organisation. Although by historical standards in most countries, the levels of organisation are higher than they were 100 years ago, also, so which again, we have to see in proportion. What can we do to reverse this situation? Again, it's not the case that we're going to reorganise the working class into unions and then workers will fight. Um, I can think of no examples in history, really, where that's been the uh, direction of determination. The point is that workers begin to struggle, and as they struggle, union organisation is built. If you look at all the key waves of unionisation, certainly in Britain and America and other key economies, they come on the back of struggles. Even in the very limited experience of the struggles we've had in Britain in recent years, every time workers actually fight somewhere, people join the union, people get involved in 
The direction of determination is from struggle to organisation, not from organisation to struggle. I'm not saying we shouldn't organise people, by the way. Of course we should fight to build union organisation. But the objective limits uh, that within which we do that are determined above all else by the uh, willingness and the capacity of workers uh, to actually fight, to actually engage in, engage in struggle. The confidence of the working class to do that is a critical uh, determinant in the situation. We have time for another round of questions and comments, so... Mm -hmm. uh, hello, thank you for the lecture. I would just like to comment on this like, uh, last thing that you said uh, uh, concerning the unions. Uh, it seems a bit odd to me that, uh, yeah, that uh, uh, there is some form of confusion uh, uh, in, uh, at least it's in, uh, in the way that uh, the unions were uh, destroyed during the last 40 years or something like that. Uh, because uh, what you said, if I, maybe you could correct me if, uh, if I understood you wrong, uh, uh, the, the problem uh, began uh, in the 80s or something like that, but when the, uh, there was a conscious attack against the unions and uh, the struggles that were active at, at that point uh, that uh, uh, didn't succeed, and that uh, formed some form of a uh, disillusionment with the union or something like that, and now they are really weak in a way. Uh, I, I would uh, strongly disagree with uh, that kind of description of the decline of the unions. What, what really is uh, 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 existing crowd is a uh, complete lack of union uh, uh, organization. For example, you have the, uh, the statistic of the number of uh, of uh, union uh, of strikes in the uh, United States during the last uh, 30 or 40 years, where well, with the uh, number of uh, workers involved uh, over the over 1,000 or more, you uh, you can see that in the 80s uh, there were uh, those kind of strikes were measured in thousands or tens of thousands of strikes. So uh, today you you have the low of uh, some 13 strikes with uh, thousands or more workers in, in the whole of the United States. It's, it's a large country with 300 million people and basically no one is striking. No one is striking. Uh, but I wouldn't really agree with the idea that uh, that the way that uh, capitalism or the state uh, attacked the unions in the last 40 years is, is some, somehow uh, really, uh, really uh, 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 profound, that, uh, that it influenced the, the, the whole uh, trajectory of the development of the unions. Uh, I believe that if you take uh, into account any uh, historical uh, overview of the union uh, organization, you would see that unions were at the beginning of the last century uh, basically uh, illegal and still uh, the workers were uh, uh, they were fighting it and they uh, achieved uh, most, uh, almost all that we have uh, today as a form of welfare state. So uh, the, I don't, don't think that the problem is the, the way that the, the capitalism or the state uh, uh, attacked the unions during the 70s, but the problem is uh, basically the left, which uh, uh, doesn't have any uh, any form of um, uh, of the alternative to what the union should be doing, uh, in a way that uh, 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 with the decline of the left, uh, you have uh, today, even if you have a union that is striking, what are uh, exactly the goals that it should achieve? Uh, have you ever heard any union member to say, okay, uh, we want a six-hour uh, work day or uh, uh, four-day uh, work week or something like that. Uh, nobody is uh, uh, asking for those kind of goals and they're not asking because uh, there is uh, no uh, organized, no uh, 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 concrete uh, th theoretical framework from the left that would uh, try to impose it. You know, uh, basically we are here uh, sp uh, speaking about socialism, but uh, in the working place, in the uh, public sphere, socialism is uh, a negative word in a way. So uh, when you ask why the, the unions are not uh, fighting, they are not fighting because they do not have anything to offer as the alternative to the, to the system. And uh, you can even see that uh, 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 in most cases they, they are actually offering the things that 
that capitalism wants, because that's the only thing that that uh, that is uh, uh, something that they understand uh, as a form of, of a theoretical framework. You know, so uh, I believe the the, the main problem is the, the, the defeat of the left, not the defeat of the union. The unions are just uh, uh, you know get got swept away and lost in the whole process where. Uh, the, the socialism and the socialist ideas are not really something that they can fight for anymore. Another question? Um, I was, I was uh, wondering, um, how do you look uh, from Marxist uh, uh, perspective on Scandinavian countries? Uh, which of course have uh, also experienced uh, the effect of globalization and uh, uh, whole and, and neoliberal uh, policies that uh, that have been enforced worldwide. Uh, worldwide. But still, um, especially in in, uh, in Sweden, um, basically their social democratic party has managed to succeed to become hegemonic. In, in, in political, in, in Gramsci political terms, in, in a way that today in Sweden no one dares to suggest neoliberal policies because that would mean political death for them. Um, the only reason why today they have uh, right wing parties is because they promise that they are going to run the welfare state better than the social democrat state. So that was the only reason. But they didn't suggest any. Uh, demolition or any neoliberal reform. So I was just wondering, um, uh, and because you also don't hear that there there is any class struggle, you don't hear that their workers would would be in such struggle. But of course, there there is probably uh, precariat in, uh, in in Scandinavia as well. But uh, it seems that there the struggle is much uh, less severe than in other countries. And, I would be just interested in how, how do you see that from a Marxist perspective. Okay, we can take one more question and then Joseph will respond and after that we'll slowly finish. Okay. Uh, it's just to slightly add to what Mislav said and you didn't answer earlier that bit that I said about welfare state. We've heard it here several times from, from the panel. Uh, to be blunt, I think it's because the Marxist left lacks its own theory of how public sector is productive in economic terms, or if you want you know, in a critique of political economic terms, or whatever you want to think of it, in any way you can think of it. But un unless a union representative can say it is productive for both the worker, the society at large, that outputs are allocated according to need, and not made into commodities sold on markets, unless we have that story and theoretical framework, like, like Mislav said, most union members, union uh, representatives, most of what they can do is just uh, you know, soften the blow of new management techniques. And in, in certain cases, which is something that some of us you know, having to work in, in Western you know, have first hand experience, is just uh, implement parts of capitalism which are less harsher and convince members, well, look, this is. Better, a better way to go as opposed to the harsher measures that can be implemented. So, the lack of uh, what's productive from the perspective of the worker, not from the perspective of capital uh, self expanding, as we would say in the MCM. So, I think that's the, uh, that's the problem that uh, Marxism has to address in some way. Joseph will respond and then Gal asks the last question. Uh, let me let me try and come back. Um, okay, one, once more on the public sector and and what I mean. Look, maybe I, I misunderstand. I, I I don't think it's that complicated to theorise from a Marxist perspective the welfare state and the public sector. I mean, um, of course, it takes different forms in different historical periods. It's different in different countries and so on. But I mean, really, you're talking about. Um, uh, the public sector becoming a central institution creating the conditions for capitalist accumulation, 
which uh, means securing the basic infrastructure, uh, in some cases capitalist accumulation, and securing the right kind of labour power, the right place at the right time for, for, for capital. That's a central function from a capitalist perspective of the public sector. It also happens to be the case that the public sector uh, delivers things for which, which benefit working class people, like uh, healthcare, education, which we, we want, sometimes housing, and so on and so forth, and, and, and we, defend those, we defend those things, of course. Um, what I think we should be very resistant of, though, is a, a notion that's become quite popular, I think, in, in, in the neoliberal period, that what we're seeing with the attacks on the uh, public sector is a, is a renewed process of primitive accumulation. Um, David Harvey puts this argument from time to time. I don't think this is helpful because what it tends to do is to play down the capitalist nature of the public sector in the welfare state, to treat it as if it was almost a different mode of production, like the uh, feudal landscape on, on, on which capitalism encroached, to drag these big things into uh, a system of capitalist, capitalist accumulation. I think what we have to assert is that the welfare state and the public sector were always, um, from their outset, bound up with a capitalist process of production and accumulation. That doesn't mean that we're agnostic about defending elements of, of, of the welfare state and the public sector, but we do so on an understanding that these things are also uh, at times beneficial uh, to capital. Uh, so that's the fir first point. Secondly, I, I said I'd come back on the question of Marxist feminism. Ju just very briefly, um, I, 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 wasn't, I definitely wasn't trying to uh, do anything as, as bold as theorise housework and, and so, on, so on and so forth. I think um, I agree actually with Lisa Vogel, whose book I'm uh, reading the republished version of, uh, that actually the domestic labour de debate was a bit of a dead end in terms of trying to um, develop this argument that housework was productive or unproductive and so on. Um, work within the domestic sphere is about reproducing uh, labour in a non-commodified non way. Um, secondly, I don't think this is a separate uh, mode of production that exists parallel to capitalism. I think it's subordinate. The family, is, the family, if you like, is subordinated to the capitalist mode of production. That's broadly uh, what I think. One thing that is worth remarking on is that uh, looking at the figures, certainly for Britain, I haven't looked anywhere else, um, the tendency has certainly been over the last 20 or 30 years for the narrowing uh, of participation rates between men uh, and women in the workforce. I think that's tremendously important because many of this, and, and that trend incidentally has continued even through the crisis as far, as far as I can work out. Now, there are limits to it, there is still a big gap. And there's still a huge, huge, huge wage disparity between men, uh, men's and women's wages. And it's still true women are pushed towards certain areas of work. Uh, nonetheless, it's quite interesting in many of the struggles that are developing, which are in Britain at least centred on the public sector, the participation of women in that uh, is on a far higher level than in any previous uh, pattern of strikes you can look at historically. The 2011 public sector strikes that Zizek was so uh, dismissive of, were the biggest strike by women ever to take place uh, in, 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 in Britain. I think it's an enormous source of uh, potential strength uh, in the struggle against the oppression of women. Uh, I won't say any more uh, uh, about that. A couple of remarks about the decline of the, uh, of the trade union movement. I certainly wasn't arguing that there was some great conspiracy in 1980 in which the ruling class and the state reorganized and smashed unions and unions disappeared. Uh, that's not my, my, my vision. Uh, why, would, why was that wave of struggles uh, from the 1960s onwards contained uh, by, by the capitalist system? I think there's a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, the role of the union bureaucracy, which Jane talked about, the existence within uh, trade unions in developed uh, societies uh, of, a, of a conservative layer of people whose objective role in society is to balance between capital and labour and negotiate on, on, on the part of workers who tend to play a conservative role in their struggles and limit them unless, unless there is a rank and file built through struggle capable of pushing them forwards and overcoming their vacillations and moving independently if they're not prepared uh, to, take, uh, to take action. It was the limits of that rank and file movement relative to the bureaucracy that in the first instance allowed the ruling class to contain and defeat uh, the, the, those waves of struggle. Secondly, was politics and ideology important in that situation? Of course it was. Um, 
the dominant politics of those trying to build the rank and file does matter, but it's absolutely true that the revolutionary left forces in that context were not on a sufficient scale, sufficient implantation in the working class struggle, and so on, to overcome uh, the uh, hegemony of reformism within, within, the, within those struggles. That's certainly a, a, a major factor in the containment of those struggles. But it's also true that in the wake of, the, um, of that process, that in key countries the ruling class did organise, did deploy the power of, states, uh, of the state specifically to smash uh, workers' organisations. The most obvious example is what happened uh, in Britain uh, almost exactly uh, 30 years ago, the great miners' strike of 1984 to 1985. Here you had a consciously drawn up plan by Margaret Thatcher, written down on paper, let's pick up a, a fight with one of the biggest groups of organised workers, let's build up stockpiles of coal, and let's smash them, and let's deploy uh, the riot police in order to do that, in, in order to break the confidence of the working class and undermine union organisation. The problem is those defeats actually reinforce the whole of the union bureaucracy and further undermine the capacity of working class people to fight uh, and, and, and to engage in, 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 in struggle. And out of that you get a long process, a gradual process, right when the struggle in the 1980s was higher than in the 1990s and uh, the 1990s was higher in most countries in the 2000s and so on. Uh, it's a process of decline which we hope will be uh, reversed. I agree with you that the key thing is reversing those, it, it, reversing that free struggle, not a gradual process of building up the unions and then we'll struggle. We have to get the order of uh, causation right. But I think we have to understand that that long process is, is, is something that has blunted the confidence of working class people. And one of the critical factors in the situation is working class people uh, regaining their confidence. And let me just finish by reiterating what I hope uh, people will take away, which is the, the critical thing in restoring that confidence and combativity in organisation of working class people is working class people themselves engaging uh, in struggle. And that, for me, is the key struggle, uh, it is a key challenge that the left uh, facing the year, year ahead to engage with, to build on uh, the limited struggles taking place, to engage in them politically uh, in the expectation and hope that at some point greater struggles will emerge in that we can play some role in making sure that we actually break through, win, and begin to challenge the capitalist system. I think that there was one more thing that Gal wanted to say. Uh, yeah, uh, very, very fast. Uh, it actually links up to this last point of the trade unions. Um, one of the things I had the feeling, uh, this is from the very first question there about your optimism, and on one side, not waiting just, but okay, uh, working class struggles appear and so on. Um, one of maybe more problematic claims also about the trade union would be um, uh, that it's not just about this lack of experience. What is really wrong, like, like or what went wrong, was not just like the breaking up, but also like what one could call class collaboration. So if capital reorganized or started reorganizing in 70s, 80s to thwart the resistance from the workers, the labor didn't do it, or it failed to kind of provide a bit more transnational, global answering to, to this question. So this is one point which is, can be very clearly verified also trade unions in Germany, in what way the social dumping and the competition towards the working class around other countries were happening. So this is like the horizon of the, let's say, trade union organization stayed within the nation state. So this is one very important uh, critique that should be placed to the trade union. The other one is what I agree with you, the breaking up of this kind of labor organization, or on the other hand, the class collaboration. And the third one comes from your own analysis of the, or also David Harvey's and so on, which is the change of the site of production. If at some point workers were concentrated in the factories or could mobilize much more easily, there is something that one could also associate with precarization, but it's like fragmentarization of the working class. And that is something that the left has to not just rethink, but also to reorganize. Good response. 